Hello, us. Greetings, everyone. Hi, Mike. Marco. Mike Lorden. Us. Good to see you. Rochelle. Hope everyone's well. Um, today, I just wanted to do a little session on um, on Torbjorn. Us. Good to see you, man. Um, do a little session on Kihon and my interpretation of what that means. Uh, mainly what I wanted to look at is uh, we, we look at the word kihon and instead of it describing basics, like every sport, every activity, every skill has basics. You know, if you want to be a good violin player, you've got to spend hours doing the uh, scales and everything. Us, Frederick and Daniel, good to see you. Buddy, us, good to see you. Um, you know, and so we know that basics exist, but the problem, not just the problem, it's also a really good answer in Kyokushin is that we see Kihon as those 30 basic techniques that we do at the start of our training session and we lock it in there. Us, Rob, good to see you. Hope Tazzy's going well. Um, but I've mentioned before, and as you know, my interpretation of, of Kihon, of basics, is anything you do when you're not actually fighting, okay? Because every, every part of training is designed to improve your fighting skills. And so everything that you do should be interpreted as a form of building, a form of building a base and build a foundation. And that's what Kihon is, basics, base. Um, I want to look at the 30 basics we can look at principles if we have time remember the 30 basics are only good if, if they're done correctly uh, and the old saying is practice makes permanent perfect practice makes perfect so you have to have it right and i was very fortunate in my years um to have spent a lot of time training with uh, matsui shoke who i think is probably one of the best um karate technicians out there and his his Basics were really, really solid, and and that rubbed off when he came and lived with us in Australia for a month and uh, trained with us every day for a month. When I think back on that, the poor bugger must have hated that. He probably wanted to go to the beach, but here he was training every day. But anyway, um, we were in that mindset then. It was 1988. Uh, so that's a really good influence to have. But the, the, the key takeaway was that everything that he did had a fundamental principle behind it that made sense you see so anyway i'm going to do a little bit of a warm-up and then i just want to run through some of the skills and one of the big things that i think is really really important that should be included uh in every training session is fundamental footwork drills because they get your body strong get your uh, your hips and legs strong uh and um remember that you know when you're in a tournament and so on when the legs go the body follows so um you have to have good strong legs having said that my legs are nothing like uh they were 30 years ago when i was a, a fighter so or 35 years ago um but i'll do my best to just demonstrate for you what i mean by some of the, the fundamental footwork drills that uh we always included uh in our um dojo and you can make these as hard or as easy as you want. You know, you can really make them, you can really turn them into a solid workout, uh, those footwork drills. And we've done that from time to time. We get someone walk into our dojo. We had a dojo which is very exposed in the city of Brisbane. And so we get people walk in from time to time, you know, and they'd be from different styles or different from kickboxing, whatever. And, um, you know, their intention was not always pure, put it that way. So what we do is we just do a really solid basics workout, like literally solid basics. Us, us, Hugo, good to see you, man. Um, that's all we do is basics. Um, and when I'm, by that I mean we'd probably spend 20 minutes to half an hour just doing um, footwork patterns and footwork drills and left, right, left, right, forward, back, left, right, body movement, body movement, this sort of thing. And usually those guys who'd come in to uh, – to, uh, put a bit of pressure on us, they wouldn't even pass the, um, the warm-up, which was always an interesting experience for them as well as us. You know, every now and then you get some tough guys that come in and 
at some stage they'd say, ask if they could have a drink break or a, or a sit down, and we'd always point to little Rebecca or Christine. Christine was um, uh, Gary O'Neill's younger sister. Christine used to train with us, and she was about 10 years old or nine. We'd say, see, that? that's Christine over there. She's 10. When she wants to sit down, you can go and sit down with her. Oh, they hated that. But anyway, we'll do a bit of a warm-up, and, uh, and then we'll just do some, some key footwork drills uh, that I like to incorporate. If you have soft mats, there's a couple of good uh, ground drills that you can do as well. Um, if if you, in your dojo you don't go to the ground, you just stick to ranges one and two and maybe three, you don't go to four and five, um, then you don't need to worry about them. But don't forget, in fact, I just happened to, as I was coming down, I found this, I have this piece of paper where I went through the five ranges, so that's kick range, punch range, headbutt elbow or trapping range, stand-up grapple range. And range four, by the way, you, you hear about what they call in Japanese gakute, gakute. Gakute literally means reverse hands or it's often, it's often translated. Remember in the early days they didn't have a, a, an, an example, so the translators had a real tough time. They had to make up the words as they go. It's easy for someone like me translating because I have – I translate on the shoulders of those who went before me. But um, the people who had to translate those early books, so we have gyakute. And gyakute literally translates as reversal hands. So handhold reversals is usually what it's known. But in actual fact, the more I've looked into it, the more I realize that gyakute is simply the Japanese word for stand-up grappling. It just means grappling because when you think about it, grappling is all about relieving wrist breaks and you know we've run through those drills where we work on the different wrist breaks here and the collars and everything like this and so gyakute literally means a stand-up grappling what's mike good to see you i'm glad it's sunny and uh, so what i did was i went through soul size books what is karate this is karate and advanced karate and i went through all the techniques that were taught in those books uniquely different techniques obviously there's a lot of overlap but and i could count them tomorrow and probably get a different number that's not the point the, the important the important point is is a fairly accurate statistical uh approach and i counted 117 unique techniques were taught okay and that includes the 30 basics and then most of you remember that if you do a combination uh you'll have those 30 basics being repeated over and over and out of the 117 techniques taught in those three key books, 13 of them, which is like, what's that, um, 9%, 13 of them were kicks, 20 or 17% were punches. So between uh, kicks and punches, you've got just over quarter. 26% of everything that Solsai taught were kicks and punches. Yet in most Kyogushin dojos, kicks and punches represent 90%, sometimes 100% of what's done. And I have been to dojos where if you want to do a, a, a bunkai technique where you're required to grab, grab someone, they'll go, no, 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 grabbing, which is fine. That's because some dojos are tournament-oriented. But don't forget that 13 and 20, 20 uh, 33 out of 117 techniques, which is that's approximately 26% of all the techniques also taught in these three main books were, were uh, punches and kicks. So that mean, leaves the other 74% in the headbutt, stand-up grapple, and the ground game. And out of them, eight techniques were in the headbutt elbow range. So that was 7%. Nine techniques were on the ground. So it's also taught nine, eight percent of the techniques that he taught were on the ground. That's nine, nine techniques. He only taught four techniques more than that in terms of the kicks. But the, the big thing was out of the 117 techniques, 67 of them, or 57 percent, were gakute, stand up, grapple inside the grapple range. So this, is, this tells you how important it is. Um, every now and then I run into old students and they say, oh, yeah, no, we heard you don't do karate anymore. We heard you just grapple. I go, well, no, that's actually not the point um, at all. We keep the grappling separate. But what we do is 
we use the grappling knowledge to understand bunkai better because there are certain movements in kata and so on which represent, you know, grabbing someone. Whenever you're pulling, you're breaking balance. Whenever you're turning, you're, you're throwing. So if you don't have a good understanding of that range for stand-up grapple or, or what Solsai calls gyakute, it's just not going to work. So anyway, I'm going to do a little bit of a warm-up and then we'll move on and we'll just do some fundamental footwork drills. Uh, I'll do my best. I've got my knee wrapped up. Um, we did a squillion my kiages on Saturday, so my legs are a little sore and uh, I can only move in certain ways on one side and certain ways on the other. But anyway, let's see how we go here. How's that for height? There. Yeah. Is that better? I, I, it's either too low or too high. I, I need to learn to, to mark it somewhere. Okay, that looks good. Us. Thanks for coming. Us hips. It's me. Some hunter. It's me. Some knees. It's me. Some hunter. It's me. Some squatting. It's me. Some she. Me. Me. Some she. Some me. Double shoulder width, twist, itch, e, sun, e, o, o, itch, touch, two, and two, middle, itch, e, sun, e, e, sun, sun, e, sun, chi, e, sun, pull the right, itch. Middle. Stretching to the right, it's neck. When you're training alone, it's always good to measure these by your breaths, remember? So it doesn't hurt when I'm tra training alone, I just do three easy breaths each side. Then I breathe in, move on to the next. Breathe out. You can do six breaths or ten or a hundred if you want, but three is a good round number, especially in the dojo, otherwise you go too long. Breathe in, bend around. One third. Spent the week weekend doing more illustrations for the book too. Gee, it's exciting. Um, Willie's doing the layout uh, and I had an opportunity to add a few more illustrations. That's pretty exciting too. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, Shkodach. Stretch, stretch the shoulder in. Breathe in, breathe out. In, out. So boom, just do a few.
हम फोर एच ए सम हम तो एच ए सम शोर कमिंग अप शोर एच सम ए ए सम वाश यू के एक्सरसाइज एच इट्स गुड to do this as i've mentioned it's good because it gives beginners an opportunity to learn the technique before they actually require it for a kata boss paul good to see everyone uh but also there's a couple more things which we add to the warm up pretty well every session uh, and that's my kyages moving my kyages and nk gyakuki and moashiuke the reason is My kyage is take your hip joints to their full, fairly full range of forward back motion, and NK get mashi uke. You, you do it in terms of large movement. See this large movement here, boom. And this is the way source I did it. It's different to Goju and, and Okinawan styles. Source I said you go big, it's easy to go small. Okay, and also NK gyakuki is the other one. not just because it teaches that that movement like this but it also opens up the shoulders nicely okay so my shoe gets knee sun she dog no it's Ah, good. Thank you, Dad. That'll do for a short version warm up. Now let's run through some of the footwork drills that we've been doing in the dojo since uh, since I've been teaching. So I guess mid early eighties, mid eighties, we included these drills, and they're drills which have tweaked along the way, but essentially remain the same. Okay, so we just and, and forgive me because, like I said, my knees shot, so I I end up my body packs it in earlier than my brain wants to. So we just just start like this, nice and relaxed, and then we start going at angles. Forty-five. See that? If you watch Gary O'Neill, I don't know if there's any videos of him online doing. His unique style of footwork. Um, I give him all credit. I definitely didn't teach him. I taught him a lot of things, but he he ended up doing a lot more than that. But he 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 does this sort of thing. It's so good. He actually taught me this, and now I'm trying to incorporate it. So you move left and right, but you notice I move around a circle. So if my partner's in the middle. Of this mat, I'm always moving to face my partner. And you throw the punch. I like to throw the punch in relation to my body weight, and that's another part of the important drill that we do. So when my weight's on my left, I throw left. When my weight's right, throw right. It's not always necessary because sometimes you want to be deceptive. So you might go the opposite way now. See that? Weight left for left, weight right for right. But now I'm being sneaky. Now I'm going weight right for left and weight left for right. See that? So that's another thing. Then from there we take those 45 degree steps, and we add a shoulder rotation. Power comes from the hips. Speed comes from the chest. Rotational speed comes from the shoulder. Rotational control comes from the hip and shoulder combined. So if you want to turn really fast, you just turn your shoulder. But if you want to turn with control, you turn your hip and your shoulder. Okay. So now we're going. If you're young, you can keep bouncing. Step forward, then rotate the shoulder. Come back. Step forward, rotate the shoulder. Step forward, rotate the shoulder. Step forward, rotate the shoulder. Then you can start to put hands in with that. So as I step, block, rotate the shoulder. Rotate the shoulder. Rotate the shoulder. See that? Step forward, block. Rotate the shoulder. Step forward, block. Rotate the shoulder. So now we do what's called a split. 
this is uh, pretty unique to coach. Uh, it's not unique to coach. It was we started to do it because this was actually talked to, taught to me by a good friend of mine. The fundamental of it was taught to me by a friend of mine, Tony Quinn. Same surname, but he's much better looking. Uh, and Tony taught me this principle, and we adapted it to Kyokushin, and it became one of the key fundamentals of everything we do. Okay, so the idea of the split is I take one foot out, one foot back, so I'm doing the splits. They serve two purposes. The front one gets me off the line of fire. So when the attack's coming in, the front foot takes me off the line. The back foot going back gives me the stretch short side, the tendon reflex. So I need to learn to incorporate that into my basics to make that concept of the tendon reflex a fundamental to everything that you do. Otherwise, both heels on the ground, you try and get a tendon reflex, it's impossible. You can't. You need to have the heel off the ground so you can stretch it, and that stretching releases, is it called, is it the Golgi tendon reflex, I think? G-O-L-G-I, I'm not too sure. But remember when you go to the doctor, he hits you there and your leg goes, that's the tendon reflex. So we take advantage of that in everything we do. So now as we move left, we split like that. So now we go one and turn the corner. When we go right, we basically come to here and then back. If you're left side forward, if you're a natural side forward fighter, you're already there, so the left is easy. Just there, rotate, back. If you're right, if you're... Uh, Going right, then you have to switch. So we take the right foot forward, the left foot back. There, there's my switch. And then I rotate back into fighting stance. If you're right foot forward, that's okay. You just split straight away there. But it means when you go left now, you have to switch like that. Okay, so switch, bang, and switch. So what I'm doing is in slow motion, remember slow is smooth, start off slowly. I'm switching, see that? I mean, I'm splitting, weight goes to the front leg and I tend and reflex off the back leg and I rotate 90, deg 90 degrees. Okay, you wanna go the opposite side, one, two, see that? There. Then I get the tend and reflex off the left leg, rotate the shoulder back to here. This is a really valuable footwork pattern. Take your fighting stance. We split. Lock. Cox comb comes up. That's the other fundamental. The reason we do all these footwork drills is to get the habit of the cox comb. What is the cox comb? The cox comb is this bone here. I think that's called the uh, metacarpal. We put that on our head like the comb on top of a rooster's head. Okay? Not the second one, not the phalanges, because that just the hand collapses into the face, up nice and high like the rooster's comb. Okay, so we're here, one, rotate, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, now what we do is we add on to that. Remember, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, so go slow, always wind back, take longer. What's well, Craig? Good to see your name pop up there. How are you? Ken, what's glad you're here. Clarence, what's good morning to you too in uh, South Africa and Gail all the way up there in Norway and Al Bellamy all the way down there in the Gold Coast. Okay, so it's that simple now. All we do is we do exactly the same movement there, there, but now watch. I go one, two, three. I throw the thigh kick. Split. So if I split left, I kick left. Split left, kick left. Split left, kick left. Split left, kick left. If I go right now, split right, kick right. Split right, kick right. Split right, kick right. Split right, kick right. Split left, kick left. Throw the right punch. Split right. Kick right. Throw the left punch. Now, we're getting into loading now. That becomes another fundamental drill that we, we can do. How to load the weight correctly on... Yes. 
myotatic reflex, not Golgi. Oh, Craig, thank you. I always get them mixed up. Golgi's a different one, yeah. Um, we have to learn to load. And by loading, I mean how do you load your weight correctly for the punch. So these footwork drills now continue where we load. We go left off the tendon reflex right. As the foot comes around, we, road, we throw the left. But now we load the right. Okay, so the whole series of techniques that we do, do for the warm-up are actually a, a, a series of drills to load your weight correctly on left and right legs, okay? So right now I'm 50-50. I've gone left. Tendon reflex with this one, myotatic reflex, as Craig just reminded me. Okay, my weight goes left. Because I'm pushing off here, I'm going to use my rotational speed off the shoulder. Bang, as my foot. Can you see my foot there? As I turn, I turn it that angle. I don't turn and keep it that angle, facing forward. I turn, keep it that angle, uh, 45 back, and I kick out my back pocket. Okay, if you're flexible, you can go thigh kick, you can go head kick. If you're really flexible, you can come up high in the hook kick too if you like. But that becomes a separate thing. This is where you start to take the fundamental drills and add complexity to it, and that's what gives you the edge later on. So here we are, split, props come up, block the kick, rotate. Notice when my watch my hands as I rotate. Left side forward means left hand is up. As I rotate now, my right hand comes up because I'm throwing the kick there. So one, shoulder forward, two, my foot turns, throw the kick. As I throw the kick, I roll my back foot. Roll my back foot like this. Bang. Try the punch. Okay? One, two, three, and back. One, right now. Two, three, back. One, two, three, back. We're doing everything really slow, but when you get used to them, you treat them as a 15-minute warm-up block. Bang, 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 bang. You get them all done really fast. Okay, now what you can do is we can do a wave. By that, I mean this sort of wave, not that sort of wave. Okay, we split, left, right, left, right. So you see the wave happening. Watch, I split off, weight's left. Turn, kick, weight's right, 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 left, right. So we actually do the wave motion to begin with like this. We start off, we go one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. There's your wave. See that? One, two, three, four, five. So you can do as many as you want. As you switch there, you can change it to a kick. Punch, punch, uppercut, boom, straight over, bang. You can do anything you want. But my legs are going like this. Okay? We go right, split. Bang, two, oh, now my weight goes here, three, four, five, six. I'm, I'm constantly waving. Okay, so that's the fundamental um, uh, split drill. You can do it without the punches and kicks. Start off here, split off, split, split. This is another way we do it without the, without the um, punches or kicks. We go right, right, left, right, left. Go left, right, left, right. Boom. 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 Like that. And that gives you a really good footwork and a sense of loading. Okay. Okay, now. We work the loading in a different way now as another footwork drill. Okay, the next footwork drill we just call um, heel, heel drill. And what it is is it teaches the students to load the weight on the correct leg. Okay. So uh, most beginners rush to hit hard. 
but you can't rush to hit hard if your basics aren't solid. So by that I mean they, they just if they're fairly strong and they're fairly fit, they'll just weigh their way yeah, and they'll just throw these wild punches. Okay. What you need to encourage students to do is realize that you know, rain wasn't built in a day. You're building up as you progress through the colored belts, you're actually building on to something. And I don't even think you get there at first dan or second dan or third dan. Anyone could tell me if sometimes as a second dan or third dan, you go and train with someone and it's an eye opener and you think, well, there goes my idea that I knew what I was talking about. Happens to me all the time. Okay, so the next drill, I'm going to roll my pants up so you can see. So this is simply, and I'll go sideways, this is simply getting the weight correct. The fundamental concept is twofold. The first concept is if I throw my weight on with my left, if I throw my left hand, my weight's on my left leg. If I throw my right hand, my weight's on my right leg. So I kind of sit down on the, uh, on the stance. By the way, Milk crates are the best street fighting weapon in the world. I've explained that plenty of times. I throw the left, my weight goes left. I throw the right, it's like I'm sitting back down. See that? I'm sitting on these crates. My weight, it's a bit, bit deceptive. My weight doesn't go backwards. My weight goes into the right, and that forms the foundation for the power for the right punch. Okay, so I'm here like this. I have the crates right here. One, see when I throw the left, my left heel comes up. Two, when I throw the right, I sit down on the crate. See that? So my weight goes to my back leg. One, two, one, two, one, two. Funky drill, I know. But it pays an awful lot of dividends in the end. So without the without the uh, crates, look, left. You start off just left. One, left. Every time I throw the left punch, I come up the left toes. There. Boom. 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 When I throw the right, I have to take my right to my right leg. Come up on the right toes. Left toes. Right toes. Left toes. Right toes. Right toes. One. This is the drill. Just like that. Toes, 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 toes. See that footwork pattern? It's just up. On the heels. And if you do that often enough, then what happens is as you start to move, every time you move, every time you throw a punch, you come up towards the toes. Now, your heel may only be the thickness of a single piece of paper off the ground, but the point is through developing that drill, your body weight is correct. The drill isn't to get the heel off the ground at the end of the day. And initially it is. The, the, the drill is to make sure that the weight is correct off the heel, okay? The point of it being, if I throw the punch here and my left hand is out when my right heel's up, there is zero power. Same thing when I throw the right. If I throw the right and come up my left foot, my weight goes to the, the ball of the foot where the heel's up. So you get no power. So the consequence of that is you'll see guys throw the right punch and the, the back leg kind of skates, comes up in the air. There's a time and place for everything, of course. If the punch knocks him out, that's great. It's not a Superman punch we're talking about, though. You, you don't want this. You want this. This idea is sitting down, sitting up. Sitting down, sitting up. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then you combine that with the metronome that we did last week. I was just watching a, an old video, an interview with Solsai, 
many years ago with some, uh, with some television personalities and he was talking about the importance of rhythm and how rhythm is really, really vital, um, really vital to uh, understand karate. Usharaj, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming. Namaste. All the way from Nepal. Okay, so then what we can do is we can start to look at um, the splits and the steps. So once we have those movements down, once we have those fundamental movements down, then we work on the splits and the steps. So for a stepping movement, I just want to shudder forward, shudder forward, shudder back, shudder forward. Notice I keep my weight going where the hand is. And even though I'm going backwards, my weight is on the right with the heel up. See that? Weight left, heel up. Weight right, heel up. Left, right. This is how you can knock someone out going backwards. Because your weight's not going backwards. Your weight's actually planted, driving forward. See, like that. Then you combine it with shuffles. So there's two types of shuffles that we always do as part of the warm-up. One is the half shuffle. Bang. Foot comes up and out. Back foot comes up. Notice I don't come up like this and down. I want my head to move in a straight line. I just swapped to see if it helps my knee a little bit. Probably not too far, it doesn't matter either way. Okay, boom. Now the trick with this is I've used this forever and with great success. And what the way I used to do it is I'd almost throw like a fake knee, a fake kick. See like that? Throw the kick and I'd use it to drive off the ground. Throw the kick fake, put it down, drive forward, lead with the punch. <laughs> like that. Like that. So it becomes a half shuffle. Like this. Then you combine the half shuffle with ro rotation and you use that Craig, we'll call it the Craig Perry now. The myotatic reflex, not the Golgi. We'll call that the Craig Perry. Everyone gets a name in my dojo. Craig, you'd be happy to know. If someone comes in and shows us something, we call that technique. So we have uh, we have whole techniques and flows named after people. <laughs> so I'll be telling everybody now it's called the Craig Perry. Okay? So what I do is I half shuffle forward. My weight's on my left, so I'm going to rotate my right. Use that tendon reflex, throw the punch. Half shuffle, rotate off, throw the punch. I'll go at an angle so you can see. Weight down, half shuffle, throw the punch, rotate, throw the punch. I can do the left punch, and this is what we do for beginners. It's like pulleys. Whenever my back foot comes forward, my front hand goes out. So you can practice that drill. Bang. Bang. And I practice it so that nothing else moves. When I throw the left, I don't want my right hand to come down. Whenever the right foot comes up, the left hand goes out. One. You can just do it like that. See that? Boom. You just stand there. We used to do this drill. This is a really good drill, which I'll do next. Don't, I can get right off on tangents and spend hours doing something else. But look, right leg comes up, left hand goes out. Right hand, a right leg, left hand. Then when the left leg goes out, the right hand goes out. Look, right leg moves, left hand moves. One left leg moves, right hand moves. That's about it for my knee. You get the idea, as my right leg moves up, my hand goes out. As my left leg moves up, my right hand goes out, and the same coming back. Boom. One, two. One, two, one, two. See that? That's a really good half shuffle drill. Now, you can get, get that coordination. This is another drill which we always incorporate in the warm-up. This is like pulleys. The 
right leg comes up, and as it goes down, the right hand goes out. Now, watch. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's right hand, right knee, right hand. Left hand, left knee, left hand. It's that simple. Let's try that right hand. Then as the right hand comes back, it's on pulleys. The right knee comes up, and as it goes out, the right knee goes down. Left hand out, left hand back, left hand out. Now, you never have two hands in or two hands out. So as the left hand comes back, the right hand goes out. I'll do it at 45 so you can see. As the right hand comes back, the knee comes up and out. Switch. One, two, switch. One, two, switch. Left hand, left knee, left hand. Then as the left comes back, the right hand switches. Right, right. Left, right, uh, left, left. Right, right, right. Left, 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 right, right, right. <laughs> left, left, left. <laughs> and then you can start to funk it up. Pull your knees in. Bang. <clears throat> like that. And you can use that drill. That's a fundamental coordination drill we call pulleys that you can do all the time. It's freezing, is it? Is it freezing or is it kind of half getting there? Yeah, exactly, Mike Lord, and that's what happens. And the guys that win those chest-to-chest -chest battles are the ones that do all the uh, correct weight movement. It's that simple. You can be standing chest to chest and one guy will do infinitely better because he's already done the fundamental um, weight drills and so on. Okay, so there's some fundamental drills. Good, okay, I'm glad it's okay. So there's some fundamental drills that we add into the beginning of every session. We start off. Left, right, left, right, left turn, right turn, left turn, right turn. Split with the hand, split with the hand. Left, right, left, right. Split left, kick. Split right, kick. Split left, kick. Split right. Kick, split left, kick, punch, punch, split right, whoops, split right, kick, punch, punch, left, kick, punch, right, kick, punch, left, kick, punch, punch. You get the wave now, see the wave, boom, boom, boom. So you practice the wave by dropping the knee, drop the knee. If you're young and fit and strong, your legs are healthy. You drop the knee all the way to the ground if you like to start with, so you get an idea that the important thing is to rotate the hips and you can even punch down. You just throw elbows down. Boom. Up. <laughs> you can see that I can't do it because my knee's shot, but you want to be like this. See that? The KRT boys, uh, they had... They have guest instructors, and they had a, a Russian instructor on that I was able to tune into. One of the greatest regrets of my life is never being awake for when the KRT boys do their thing because in Australia time it's like 3 in the morning or something, um, and then it goes for an hour and a half. So it's not unless I get up a couple of hours early, I'm going to miss it. But they have some great stuff, okay? So you need to look up uh, KRT online. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. If I was a young tournament fighter in this COVID, I'd be there at KRT every single opportunity. Anyway, one of that, that Russian guest, he was doing this old drill that we did. You go here. He added a few tweaks to it that I found really interesting too. He adds this downward punch. We used to do an elbow across. <laughs> And here's the beautiful thing of this. 
we actually use this movement in the dojo here. We'll come in, break through the guard, arm around the neck, boom, and then pull them down into Kesagatame, uh, which I think we did in one of our sessions. And this is the move that you get. You can actually take the leg for a, a grappling thing. You take the leg away all the way through as well. So there's that part of it. Now, if you do grapple, there's a couple of really valuable drills that are worth, worth looking at. I won't do it for now because I don't think we have a lot of uh, grapplers here. But if you're not incorporating fundamental gyakute and re wrestling in your stuff and getting a little feel for that, well, you know, you know, Sol Sai placed a lot of value in that and he talks about gyakute all the time. If you've got those books, uh, this is karate, what is karate, advanced karate, look up in the index uh, gyakute. I'll write it down for you so you get the correct spelling. I know, no, most of you got it. Anyway. Gyakute. Oh, why isn't it typing? There we go. And that equals grappling. That's the, the most suitable translation that I've been able to come up with. So you need to be doing a little grappling. So what we'll do for a warm-up is we'll just stand there. We've done it. I've done it every now and then when Josh comes over. You just do the, the hand grapples. Boom, boom. It's a form of Chinese sticking hands, if you like. Boom. Getting the two-on-one. Getting the two-on-one out. Getting the wrist top elbow control. Getting the arm drag, getting the two on one this way, getting the wrist bottom control. It's just a series of like that. And you could just spend five minutes doing that and you get uh, tremendous um, results. So, the bottom line here, what I'm trying to say to you is Kihon is not just the 30 basic techniques. Kihon is everything that you do when you're not actually in the fight, when you're not actually in the game. And if it's not, then you need to reshape your thinking. Because karate isn't uh, the training. Well, it isn't, it isn't. What I mean is the goal of all the training is to make your skills in the game, in the fight, better and better and better and better. So to that end, if you think about it, everything you're doing has to be done with the mindset of um, drilling a basic, doing my chords on the piano, my scales, that's what they call them on the pianos, and my scales on the violin. That's just drilling the basics over and over and over again, okay? Now, when it comes to uh, the 30 basics, I don't want to talk too much about it because we don't have a lot of time and I want to wind up at four. But let's just briefly look here for a sec. Can I come forward? Yeah, I reckon I can come forward about there. So we take our sun chin. Now remember, for instructors, the sun chin isn't a circle. Don't get them to do a circle. Get them to come in and out, in and out. See that? So in, out, in, out, in, out. So that knee then becomes the block for the groin kick. Boom, bang, okay? When your hands uh, step out, don't take them wider than the body. In, out, there. It's also taught that the wrist is in line with the shoulder. Some Kyokushin styles are starting to change now. I ran into one of my old mates who trained with me from white belt to third dan. He's now a fifth dan in one of the other groups. And he was telling me they're changing everything, changing all the, all the kata, all the basics and everything. And the, the, the changes that they're making, that's 100% fine if you, want to, if you want to make changes. Just make them significant changes because he's talking about changes like, my, whereas in Solsai would teach to come here, now they're teaching to go here. See the difference? Well, I mean, really, that's not a change. That's just being pedantic. Um, but having said that, whatever you do, it's like a, that's why when we do um, Kaikoku, I'll teach this as well as teach this before you step through. So there's value in everything. So if it works, that's great. It's just not soul size Kyokushin. Okay, so we come in, 
we're here. Now, here's the next thing to remember. For instructors, some of the key, key, simple, simple features, I should say features twice as well, features, features, are, first of all, no sway. Try to get your students to have their head perfectly still. And to that end, another fundamental drill you can use is even though your head stays to the front as you move, in actual fact, as the body moves around it, your head is turning. So to develop that skill, what you do is you put your arms out and you turn your shoulders without turning your head. I think my neck's turning okay, so it's kind of staying in front. See that? You have to get used to keeping the focal point. This is why the, the fundamental um, default position, you, you have two axes for a start. You have your left leg and your right leg. There's not one axis. There's actually two, and you know that to be so because if you stand like this and then try and do a kick, you'll find very quickly that you have to move from one axis to the other. Okay? You have one spine, but you have two focal lines. And if your head movement is even slightly off, it means one eye is that much in front of the other, which means they're registering at subtly different lengths and the timing changes. So you've got to get used to keeping your head perfectly still. So you start by doing this, keeping the head still as you move your shoulders around. And see, when you, now when you do my, the techniques, you're not doing this. See, guys do this all the time, okay? You want to make sure the head is dead still. Keep the head dead still. You're going here. The difference between Udaken Gummen Uch is the elbows down, shooting forward. So that means you can do an Udaken Gummen Uch to the side if the elbow is down. Okay, but the 30 basics are like different letters, so also I call them the alphabet. Okay, so you, each one, there is relationships between different techniques, but they are very different. So Udaken to the front, elbows down. Udaken to the side, you don't go elbow down and shoot. That's just doing this one over again. You look, leap at the elbow, and roll it over the elbow. See like that? Not down. Okay. Here, arms are at 90 degrees. 90, not 180. 90, 245, the elbows are in on the body. It's a close range technique. So you use the power of the body. Okay, it's always good. Well, let's go on to the blocks. Just, I just want to run through a fundamental keys. And the first key is head dead still, always to the front. So even as I go around the, the technique. So remember, close the gate. All blocks, close this gate here. I block down, bring the arm over, push forward. One, two. Notice my hand doesn't go from this side to this side. The hand comes across and stays in line with the opposite shoulder, all the way up. Down, across, I've brought my hand in line with this shoulder, now I push it up. One, two, one, two, one. There's your block, there's the takeaway. All blocks are two-handed. One, two, across, one, two. In line with the opposite shoulder, one, two. Inside, from underneath, elbows come together. Outside, point, elbows together. Point. If you, if you te teach your students one important thing, and that is all the time, if they think of elbows coming together when they're blocking, look, upper block, elbows are together. Look, boom, uchiyuke, elbows are together. Uchiyuke geranbara, elbows must touch. This is the big one thing that people make the mistake. <clears throat> it's not like that. When you do uchiyuke, the body turns and it comes there. When you do gerambarai, it comes there. So it's a combination. So it means the elbows must touch. Elbows touch, two. Good, a good instructional idea is whenever you're breaking it down for students, always break it down to two or three moves. One, two, one. You can even break it down to three. 
Easier to see from the side. Now watch the plane of the hand. One, hands come back to the shoulders. Push out two. One, two. One, two. So it's not like a propeller on the front of a plane. It's actually at 45 degrees. The hands come in and out. In and out. See that? In and out. In and out. In and out. In and out. Nice and easy, nice and relaxed. Like that. Get on but cross over, elbows touch. Cross over, elbows touch. The only one that they don't touch is this one, but the elbow still comes across the, the front of the line. Under, across. So they're just some uh, pointers for your basics. So remember, the takeaway for today is that no, uh, basics as we know it. Yeah, you're probably right, King. I don't know which group. Um, I don't know which group you're with, Ken. That's a fair point. Um, my buddy that I ran into, uh, he's with Matsui Group, and he, he's fine. He's happy. He'll be happy with whatever they tell him to do. Um, uh, but my argument is, you know, when uh, Nakamura Tadashi left and Oyama Shigeru and Sato Katsuaki and Azuma Daigo and, and uh, all the different, when they leave, they leave and they leave with honor because they don't try to convince the world that they're still teaching Kyokushin. You know, so when Ashihara breaks away, he doesn't do Kyokushin Ashihara, he does Ashihara Karate. But what's happening in some of these groups is that they're changing everything but they're hanging on to the Kyokushin name and they're arguing, they're, they, they rationalise it by saying, well, if we don't move on with the times, we'll stagnate and die. That is not, that's what, not what they're doing. They're not moving on with the times because you can move on with the times within the framework of what Soulside taught because there's so much there. You know, um, changing things from this to this is not moving on with the times. It's changed, in my opinion, could be wrong been wrong once before i thought i was wrong and i was right i was wrong turns out but anyway my point is um if you want to change things do it with honor and don't just keep calling it kyokushin there's the only reason some people make changes and use the name kyokushin is for money you know because there's money in it tournaments are killing kyokushin because many techniques are not taught and will be exactly exactly yakute this is why you know and my good buddy and I, I like him. He's a good guy. Um, he's in his 50s now. He started training with me when he was a teenager. But anyway, that's, that's my argument is that uh, there's so much within Kokushin to uncover and unravel using Kaisei, Kaisei no Gendi, um, Toki Tomusubi, as uh, Miyagi Chojin called it, the unraveling and the tying up of the knot points. Um, and like you said there, Mike Lorden, um, the gyakute, but what's contained within the gyakute and the grappling concepts is just fantastic. Yes, that's it, Craig Perry, KRT, Tips and Tricks. Um, go, you should subscribe to their channel. Unfortunately, Craig, they start at like, um, you know, a really ungodly hour for Australia because they're in the UK. But that's Wesley and uh, Darren. And uh, their stuff is fantastic. It's the stuff I would love to have been doing when I was 20, 21. And uh, Darren Stringer, he still moves like he's 20, 21, but he must be in his late 30s, you know, but he's maybe even 40s. Look, he's a good example of how you should be able to move even at that age. I don't think, definitely don't think 35 years old, definitely don't think 40 years old. At 40, I was still firing. And, and in fact, until I hurt my knee at 53, I was still fairly youthful. So if you maintain activity, you'll stay youthful. It's that simple. But that's them. Craig, KRT, Tips and Trips, that's the one. Um, Mike, Kihon equals fundamentals, yes. That's it, not basic. It, it's just, it's, it's in Japanese, they have a phrase, they say, Kihon Teki. So you're talking to someone, say, Kihon Teki, you didn't know it. So, so basically what you're saying or fundamentally what you're saying is, so it, what it refers to is the fundamentals 
of the of the system. It doesn't mean just the 30 basics. It means everything that you do that improves your fighting. Solsai was adamant about relaxing the shoulder. Now, I'm, I'm, I might have to read that a couple of times, Mike, but I know Uchiuke, for example, in some styles, it's even higher like this, right? Um, uh, I believe Storyu has a higher block. And the reality is that transfers very well to a real situation where you're there, bang, you need to pick the hand up. But Solsai's whole thing was relax the shoulder. Solsai said that 90% of all problems can be related to excessive tension in the shoulder. So by lifting the arm, he may have related that. And he always liked to make sure the, the armpit is closed. Is, is it possible to keep the armpit closed off if the fist is held higher than the shoulder in Chudan? Okay, so you're saying ours are, is high. Is this key with? Yeah. Well, ours is the height of the wrist there. And I'd say so also I did that because th with the open hand then, I have face cover with my arm closed. I don't have to re-educate myself to go from a middle block to an upper block. Boom. See that? I have my hand at a fundamental shape with my elbow exactly where it would be. Look, see that? Uchiuke. Chudansuke. Uchiuke. Fire stance. The elbow position. You can tell because in relation to the the line at the bottom of the uh, screen, my elbow height doesn't have to change to bring that. See that form? Uchiuke, sotuke, boom, bang. There, like that. See that? Now, I could be uh, misinterpreting your question there, um, Mike, but basically, Sol Sai's point was always waki or shimeru, close the waki, close the waki. Lack the shoulder, close the waki. And that transfers well to the there too, because the gyakute principle of control is heavy elbow. So you make your elbow heavy. So they all tie in. Um, I'm not, this isn't directed to Mike. Mike already knows, but that all ties in together in that as soon as you put excessive tension in the shoulder, you have a rising elbow. And any grappling that you do, any gyakute techniques, you need a heavy elbow. Okay, so keep that in mind. Rob de Souza, you've just given me a little bit of a reminder. Yeah, get the heck out of here. Okay, got your message. Uh, thanks, everybody. Appreciate all you Aussies coming in. Is it a public holiday everywhere or is it just in Queensland? But anyway, um, Mark, look, look out for your books tomorrow. Hopefully they'll arise. They'll arrive. Thank you, everybody. I think... Mike Lord's question, what's my opinion on why most people begin karate training? I think we have a fundamental, um, almost um, genetic disposition towards fighting. The nature of life is war. The nature of life is fighting. Um, every breath we take is a battle between the oxygen and carbon, carbonized, um, carbon dioxide in the body. So right down on a cellular level, there's a battle going on all the time. So I think it's in our nature to fight. And like, um, like uh, Walt Whitman said, all the poems of all the poets that have ever been written is about one thing, and that's the, the theme of war and the making of warriors. And uh, like Sri Yukteswar says also that we go on through life, and life is a series of suffering moments and redemptions, but we go on. And we get to some point where we question things and at that point we become a warrior. So I think, um, quite honestly, um, Mike Lorden, it's, it's got something to do with our human nature. Um, was it Mike Lorden or Mike Clark asked? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, it's, it's our nature to uh, want to be able to protect ourselves. It's our responsibility to look after ourselves, um, even... Even little animals learn from the day they're born how to defend themselves. So I think it's natural. Having said that, probably the psychological thing that goes on is um, guys want to be strong. Um, you know, girls want to be fit and healthy. Yeah, there you go, Ken. Yeah. Very interesting to me too, Mike. Uh, but anyway, Mike, Gordon, that's my answer to that. Thanks, guys. I hope you got something out of that. Um, yep, yeah, they should be there tomorrow, Marco, hopefully. Let me know if they arrive on time. Um, Sven, Paul, 
Good. Danke schön. Have a good day. Thanks again. My, yeah, look, I'm interested in that, all that sort of stuff. Um, good on you, Mike. Self-defense, fighting, protection. Yeah, yeah, lots of things other than tournaments. That's right. There's not many people who go into fighting. The only, I only know one guy actually took up karate specifically to be a tournament champion. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you Friday. Have a uh, great week. Us. Don't forget, if you're not a, a um, member, I always forget. They tell me that I'm meant to do this every time. Patreon, thank you very much. You're saving my butt, butt again. I'm still trying to build that. Um, but if you're not a member of Patreon, go along. Check out my Patreon. Uh, you might enjoy what you see. And... Um, it helps me tremendously to be able to do these things. Otherwise, subscribe and share. Don't forget, if everyone who subscribes shares to just five people and says, just come along and join in with this, you'll really like it. Well, then, and, and if those five share, the next thing you know, we've got a multi-level marketing industry going on here and my um, subscriber base will increase no end. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. Thanks, Mike. Us, Herman. Mike Lorden. Thank you. Harry, Frederick, Ken. Us, I didn't see you there, Ken. Hope you're well. Thank you very much. Us. See ya. <laughs>